Coming up on the midpoint of Nintendo Power's seventh year, with Nintendo Power issue 66 for November of 1994, and we're continuing the lead up to the launch of the Nintendo 64. Let's get started. Our cover game of this issue is Donkey Kong Country, with Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong on the cover in their 3D pre rendered glory. In the letters column for this issue, you have a couple positive letters and one negative letter on their strategy guide for Secret of Mana. We move right into the game coverage for this issue with, well, Donkey Kong Country. This has a fair number of level maps, so they're not exactly going level by level through the game, skipping over bits here and there. It's still sticking to the early parts of the game, though. Donkey Kong Country is a fun platformer, but it's one that's got some real issues. There are some problems with enemies showing up below you and being just out of the camera's view without any real way to shift the perspective to movement of frames. That's something that even Super Mario World did. Other than that, success in the game is based pretty much on learning enemy patterns and the rhythm for some of the levels. It's challenging, but the game also gives you enough extra lives early on that that's not going to be too much of an issue. Next up is Sparks, the sequel to Rocket Knight and Fencers for the Genesis. The article gives notes and level maps for the first four stages. Sparkster is both incredibly fun and punishingly hard. It has a sense of blistering speed matched only by Sonic the Hedgehog on the Genesis, with the inclusion of vertical movement in basically six directions. However, Sparkster has a health meter instead of rings, and that changes how damage is handled. In Sonic, if you could grab just one ring, then unless you fell in a bombless pit or drowned, you were more or less fine if you took a hit. Whereas in Sparkster, you have a finite amount of health, and while there are certainly health power-ups in the levels, you still have to hunt them down first. It definitely hinders the sense of speed for in a significant respect here. You have more margin for error with Sonic than you do with Sparkster. It's still a really fun game, but if you're going to be planning on Blasting through the levels, especially since you are not nigh invulnerable when you are blasting. Be warned. Also, this game has limited continues, so boo on that. Nintendo Power has continued its coverage of the arcade version of Killer Instinct with a rundown of the comic combo mechanics for the uh, arcade version, with a particular focus on how combos are structured. Next up is the first of a two-part strategy guide for Earthworm Jim. The guide is maps for the first four stages, with additional maps of levels 5 through 7 promised next month. Since we've got a sports roundup this issue, and that's a lot of games to cover there, I'm going to hold off on a full review until next month. Another sports scene column for this issue leading into our sports roundup. The article is notable for the fact that the guide goes a little more in-depth on their coverage for NBA Live 95 and Michael Andretti's IndyCar Challenge. They're not full-on strategy guides, but they are getting more involved in those games. However, we still have a very large lineup this issue, so let's get d down with that. NBA Live 95 has some really weird problems. It's using a weird isometric perspective, which basically gives the gameplay advantage to whoever has their hoop on the upper right of the screen in terms of the team. It doesn't give you any information on who has possession of the ball. Yes, there's an indicator around your feet to control your who you control to show you who you're controlling. But the only indicators you've got of the player, as far as for who they are, is number, skin color, and facial hair. Now, if you're playing the Bulls, you would know that 45 is probably Jordan. And if you're playing the Blazers, you know that number one is Rod Strickland. But is that white guy Arvita Sabonis or Chris Dudley? I hope you memorize their number. Now, this may be a case of them just not having the NBA Players Association license, but this also makes it important as to why it's good to have the NBA Players Association license. It lets you make snap decisions during play as far as who to pass the ball to. Um, if you're playing your team, most people know their, know their team by the names of their players, not always necessarily their number. Again, I couldn't tell you um, Navidis Sabonis' uh, number. I had to look up Rod Strickland's number, and when Drexler was playing with us, the only reason I knew his number was because I had a big cardboard standee of Clyde Drexler. So, yeah, there's that. 
Moving into car racing, we have Michael Andretti's Indy IndyCar Challenge, which plays incredibly well. The controls are fairly smooth, considering we're in the days before using analog triggers to control acceleration. And for the default settings, the game does a really good job of tuning your car for each track. So if you do want to fiddle with things, they're basic enough where you can generally figure out what you want to do without getting as hyper granular as the tuning options in the Forza games. Also, the game has Portland International Raceway on its list of tracks, which gets it a few more additional points. Street Hockey 95 is our next game, and it makes a simple, really, really stupid gameplay design decision that makes the game utterly unplayable. It not only has the camera follow the puck, which, I mean, is important. You want to know where the puck is at all times in a game like this. But it also takes away the player's ability to change characters, meaning they can't switch players to whoever on the team has the puck. Which means there's going to be chunks of the game where you, your character, is completely off camera and you won't know where you are, why you need to move in order to get back on camera, and basically the game is just playing itself. And so, consequently, it's not worth your time to actually play this game, because you're not really able to properly do so. So don't. ESPN's League Night NFL is, in a lot of ways, a perfect example of a, foot of a football game that's aiming for Madden and missing. It's got a very similar, very grounded, and realistic style, except for what's missing in control. For example, the game doesn't call out what receivers are where, on the field and attached to what inputs so you can pay attention to coverage and tell who to pass to and when. Running plays those work well, but when I accidentally pass to someone in the backfield and lose yardage because I don't know who gets what input, that's not cool. Appropriately enough, enough next up this issue is Madden 95. And this game, by contrast, really shows how you make a f good football game. The controls are intuitive, you get a good sense of what your plays do, and when you're doing passing plays, and also when you're selecting one, you have a way of telling how clearly the coverage is around your receivers so that you know who you should be passing to. Animations are very fluid, and the sound is excellent. At this point, Madden is clearly setting the bar for how you make a football video game, and for very good reasons. Jammit is from the same developers as Street Hockey 95, and that speaks volumes to the game's quality. It handles the camera perspective in the same way, with incredibly stilted controls and even more stilted animations with the digitized character sprites that are clearly trying to cash in on the success of NBA Jam. This doesn't help by the fact that this is a port of a 3DO game that was only really notable on that system because 3DO hadn't gotten a port of NBA Jam yet. Whereas, by contrast, on the Super Nintendo, which has already gotten a version of NBA Jam, and combined with these god-awful controls and animation, this game can just go take a flying leap. We wrap up the sports coverage for this issue with Cannondale Cup. It's not bad, it's just bland. It's a boring, kinda sluggish bicycle game with some generic 90s flair. It controls well enough, Though it gets choppy when you have a bunch of characters on screen, which is in turn aggravated by having random spectators run out of the race as an obstacle. The game is okay. It's not good. It's not. It's not bad. It's just fine. Um, now there is a peripheral for this of an exercise bike that you can use to control this game, and that may certainly change things up considerably from a gameplay standpoint. But I don't have access to that, and I suspect. If you're finding a loose copy of this at a flea market or at a retro gaming convention somewhere, probably neither do you. The Final Fantasy III guide continues with general plot notes, but no maps or really specifics on any of the game mechanics, and it covers the game through the floating island. This means we don't get information on how espers work, we don't get stuff like Saban's move list, nor... Do we get the correct options for the opera scene? Now I can see skipping the last, but for a strategy guide, I would have liked to have gotten Saban's move list because it's an intrinsic part of his character and not all of those moves are necessarily surfaced in the game. 
Also, the Asper mechanics would be coming up by this point in the game, and it'd be nice to have a discussion of, okay, here's what they are, here's how they work, and kind of sell that aspect of the game for people who were hesitant to pick this up and were interested to see how this game was different from Final Fantasy IV, aside from visual aspects. It's, I mean, it's one of the biggest shifts from this game to Final Fan from by comparison to Final Fantasy II. Now, the guide finishes up next issue, so I'll have my review then. In the classified information column, we get a special code for a stage skip for Star Trek The Next Generation, but not much more than that. No, I lied. We get a complete move list for Mortal Kombat 2, with not just a list of the fatalities, babalities, and friendships, but also all the special moves, what you need to do to get toasties in each character's pit fatalities, along with how to get to each of the hidden combatants, and how to just jump straight to Kintaro and Shao Kahn. It busts the game wide open. Which is kind of neat seeing that here. Continuing with the Super Nintendo titles, we've got Indiana Jones Greatest Adventures, a collection of levels based on the first three Indiana Jones films. The only Indiana Jones films they ever made. Anyone who tells you about something something Crystal Skull is lying. Anyway, there's a selection of maps and notes for levels from Raiders, before giving a few notes for levels for Temple of Doom and The Last Crusade. The general rule of thumb that I've heard is that Indiana Jones games are generally bad, at least ones that aren't adventure games on your way. I think Indiana Jones Grace Adventures is something of an exception. It's a platformer with incredibly fluid controls and animations, and well-designed levels with the one flaw being a limited number of continues and stinginess when it comes to extra lives. The game is fun and handles adapting the first three Indiana Jones films to video games in a non-adventure game form in the right way. I had a blast playing the game for the show, particularly considering the track record for Indiana Jones games on consoles is, again, not especially great. Next up is Super Adventure Island 2, which shifts the Adventure Island series from conventional platformers to something closer to a Metroidvania, or I guess just a Metroid at this point. A shift the Wonder Boy series, which Adventure Island was originally based on, had already made. The guide gives maps and notes for each of the islands through the penultimate island. While I appreciate that Super Adventure Island 2 is more ambitious in its scope, I'm also kind of bummed by how the game changes things up. You only have one life before you have to continue, which is kind of frustrating, and also the game being generally slow about giving you any sort of ranged attack, whereas other titles give you the throwing hatchet almost immediately. Otherwise, it does give you unlimited continues, which is good, and you can save pretty much anywhere on the overworld. Also very good and very useful. So it, it, it's okay, but it's not quite what I'm looking for. Next up is Wild Snake, a puzzle game based on falling snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? Apparently, Alexei Pajitnov was involved with designing this game, and I'm not entirely clear from the actual article how the actual gameplay works. So, the way the mechanics of Wild Snakes works is that snakes drop from the top of the screen, and once they hit the bottom, they slither as far forward to the left or right as they can before they hit a wall or are blocked by a snake of a different color. When a snake touches another snake of the same color, then the snake that exists on the board is eliminated, and any snakes that that snake was blocking slither forward, while the snake that is currently dropping continues to drop. If the snake that is slithering forward touches another snake of, the, diff of uh, the same color, then the snake it touches is also eliminated, and so on, allowing, theoretically, setting up combos. It's clearly an attempt to continue and to elaborate on the gameplay concepts of Tetris, but it ends up being really clunky in its execution. It's an interesting concept, and I'm glad to see Pajitnov e innovating and iterating on his original game, but this version doesn't quite work, mainly because of the way the snakes move. Tetris pieces are very predictable in how they move, and they provide a significantly granular degree of control. In fact, all of the best puzzle games give you a granular detailed amount of control on the movement of your pieces, whereas the slithering aspect of this takes away from that considerably. So you don't have as much control, or at least 
mod control you get requires you to put in a lot more practice and learn to work around the snakes as opposed to just learning the movements of the pieces and planning out your movements quickly on the fly. It adds an additional mental processing step that's not present in Tetris. In Counselor's Corner, we have questions about Lufia and the Fortress of Doom. Next up is further coverage of Illusion of Gaia, covering each of the major bosses all the way to the final boss fright. I suspect this helps save on calls to the Counselor's Hotline. Our short bit of Game Boy coverage this week starts off with a rerun of their coverage of Contra the Alien Wars, which I covered back in episode 48. There will be links in the show notes. This is followed up by info on the Super Nintendo version of Space Invaders, which you can get by using the Game Boy version with the Super Game Boy, which I covered when I reviewed that game. There will also be links in the show notes. The top 20, Mortal Kombat 2, has still failed to break the top 5 on the Super NES, which I find rather surprising since it's been out for a few months. Meanwhile, Final Fantasy 3 has entered the top 20. In the now-playing column, among the also rans is the sequel to Uncharted Waters, subtitled New Horizons. We also have on the RPG front, Might and Magic 3. Might and Magic 2 got released for the Genesis. And also Shaq Fu, which is interesting because Shaq Fu got making of coverage earlier, and I would have thought that that would have led to it getting a feature article. That may say a bunch for the confidence or lack thereof that the Nintendo Power staff has for the game. Finally, in Packwatch, Bridge Interactive has a game based on The Lion King, Sunsoft has Arrow the Acrobat 2, and Interplay has Star Trek Starfleet Academy. Now, the obvious pick of this issue would be Donkey Kong Country. However, if you've already got Donkey Kong Country, and the, the odds are pretty good that you do, um, it's available like in tons and tons of well, platforms, Super Nintendo Mini, um, it's been in all the various varieties of the Virtual Shop, Virtual Shop, that sort of thing, plus it's a, I'd say it's a common game, but it's, it's not hard to find. My next recommendation would be giving Indiana Jones Greatest Adventures a shot. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like sub and subscribe and click the little bell button to be notified whenever new episodes show up on my channel. If you really like the show, please consider backing it on Patreon. Backers will get their name in the credits and at higher levels you get episodes up to one week early and at even higher levels you can select what games that I do for my future Let's Plays. You can find my Patreon at patreon.com slash count zero O-R.